Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, we're going to talk about several things. We're going to talk about, first of all, when it's time to kind of say goodbye uh, to a plant uh, in the garden. We had this uh, cotinus or purple smoke bush that was out here maybe three years ago. We cut it really, really hard, cut it back. It's in weight, it's in a little bit too much shade in this space and it was stretching way out. It wasn't ever blooming. Uh, so we cut it way back and we kind of gave it this reset opportunity. And what it did was it actually just put limbs back out onto the street, stretched way, way, way out. It had a couple flower buds on it, but not much. Uh, we have a neighbor that has one over here that's in more sun and it's just quite a bit more showy and full. I don't need plants to be perfect. So this isn't about, I don't want you to take this as, you know, if the plant's not perfect, it has to go at all. This one is just, it clearly is not happy in this spot. It just wants to rate, you know, go out to more, more sunlight over there and it's stretched out and it's not really, this is this front corner of the lot. We can see way down the street here, more so even now <laughs> that we've taken, taken this tree out. But, uh, we wanted something in here that would be slightly fuller that we couldn't just see absolutely completely through and so we've got we've got the idea for that but i came over here i've got an old video on the channel about how to remove old plants in the garden it's one of the funnier videos i've ever put up because i did it. i just took out some hollies by hand that had they were carissa hollies that had reverted uh, and they had several issues and they were too big and they were next to my sidewalk at the old house and just the comments below it are funny because i did it by hand there are comments like, you got to go to your garage and get your engine hoist. And then you can just hoist them right out of the ground because everybody has an engine hoist. And there's all kinds of clever ideas for getting shrubs out of the ground. That video was more about how do you get something out of the ground if you can't get a piece of machinery to it uh, and you have to do it by hand. This one, I could back the truck up to and grab a hold of it and then break and then basically chip roots away, pull a little bit, chip roots away pull a little bit until it came out of the ground. Uh, it had been here for a long, long time, and so it was well anchored into the ground, mostly taproot. It was interesting, it had almost virtually no horizontal rooting across the ground. It was, you know, just straight down into the ground, which was, which was really kind of interesting. But it frees up this big open space, and this theme of this season here in the Raleigh Garden is corner to corner. We've basically been hiding things in corners for three years, four years in this project while we did other spaces. And now we're going to finish all, to all the way to all four corners in this garden over the course of the spring season. So we went back to our storage area in the vegetable garden where we put in all of our container plants, shrubs last year, planted them in the ground so they'd be protected through the winter time. Now we need to come up with places to use them very quickly because in two weeks or so, we'll be putting on our vegetables. So need to get that stuff out of there pretty quick. We knew that this, um, uh, ma this evergreen maple or smooth bark maple, this is Acer laviagatum, which I'm probably butchering. Uh, this particular this particular plant was actually found by Mark Wethington, and uh, the name is Hong Long. Uh, it's a pretty rare maple. It's evergreen. It's zone 7B to 10. Uh, you can see the beautiful coloration in these leaves. The, it's going to be the the winter you're having will determine how evergreen it is. But for us, this winter has just been so mild that uh, here we are at the. Uh, the end of April it hasn't lost a leaf uh, the entire winter. Uh, again, I dug it up out of the ground. It had been in the container for a long time. And in fact, the tag that's on it, you know, be careful with this. If you're, you know, when you're planting your plants, it's nice to have tags on things. It's nice to know what you have, but these tags can become embedded in these plants uh, over time. So make sure you're getting them off as you're planting and then, you know, writing them down, putting a, some other stake in the ground, whatever you want to do to remember, you know, what your plants are, but make sure these little kind of these types of tags come off of them uh, as you're planting them. It should be pretty easy digging because I already dug a plant. I already dug a plant out of this space. We have not amended this soil up here like we have everything else, but it has been mulched for a few years. And just that mulching has definitely improved the soil. There's always a ton of roots on this side of the garden because our neighbor's maple is uh, quite greedy. Holly's just going to uh, supervise this operation.
we got this thing, I think almost two years ago, and we've had it in a container just waiting for the opportunity to, you know, to have the perfect place for it. I think we got this from Garden Treasures down in Zebulon, North Carolina, but I know Mr. Maple has it on their site and Nurseries Caroliniana has it on their site, but I believe it says sold out right this minute. It's a very rare tree, so it's probably gonna cost a little bit just because there's not a lot of them when they are available, but it's, it's really beautiful. It has, the new growth will be this really intense maroon uh, purplish color. The bark has a purplish color. It's super, super smooth uh, to, to the touch. It's got this one limb down at the bottom coming off the side. And you know, if I know I'm gonna take something off in the future, I typically will just go ahead and do it uh, at that time. And I think immediately it looks, uh, it's a better looking tree. I think ultimately I'm gonna end up taking a few of these others off as well and just leaving this where it divides right here uh, as where, you know, where, where I'll allow it to branch from. This is not a tree for full sun. So we've got it in a spot here where it need, it's gonna get lots and lots of morning sun. It's sun's coming up on me right now. And then by 11 or 12 in the morning, it'll be back in dappled, dappled but bright light. I think that should be the perfect place for it. Whereas that, uh, that purple smoke bush was just absolutely reaching for light. It just was not absolutely positively not enough light for it to be able to flower and to, uh, you know, and to be full and compact. And again, I don't need a plant to be perfect, but that one was just, it was always going to be lopsided like that. There just wasn't anything we could do with it. I often tell folks though, give it a chance, reset it like we did with that one, see what it does. And if it doesn't come back that second time around and look like you want it to look, then, you know, go ahead and look for something to replace it with. But this Hong Long maple, I think is the perfect replacement for this front corner. We got a little more work to do out here to uh, finish this little corner up. So let's do it. Next up is this Taiga Clematis. I had one of these at the old house and there's a video uh, specifically on this plant if you want to go back and take a look at it. It was released back in just 2017, uh, introduced at the Chelsea Flower Show. Really incredible double flowers on this thing, incredibly showy. Uh, just one of the most amazing clematis I've ever seen. It bloomed like crazy at the old house. These bloom, these grow all summer long and can continue to bloom throughout that period of time. It's a, in the type three group, so these benefit from being cut extremely hard in the late winter, you know, down to a foot tall even. We're actually gonna grow it, allow it to grow up this guide wire that's out at the road. We've been putting some other annual vines on it the last couple of years, but, but the fact that this one gets cut down to the ground makes it a good candidate for this, but, so it doesn't, I don't, I wanna, I don't wanna let it grow up into the, you know, up into the power lines up here. So every winter we'll be able to cut this thing down to the ground, re-get control of it, and then allow it to come right back up. So again, excited about this one. Clematis can actually benefit uh, Clematis clematis. Let me say clematis at the same time so nobody uh, corrects me. There are two, two very distinct pronunciations of this. Uh, when, uh, they can actually benefit from being planted a little deeper than other things. And normally I'm always talking about raising things, raising things, but clematis can go down a little lower. I don't here in my clay soils. But if I had a better, more well-drained soil, you can plant them a little deeper and it will, basically encourage suckering to happen almost immediately. So where as you're buying a clematis, which may be expensive because they're not the fastest, they're not the easiest thing to root. They're not the fastest thing to grow out into a container. Uh, it may only have just one single vining part coming up from the base of the soil. If you plant it deep frequently, you'll, you know, it'll, it'll, vine, it'll sucker rather quickly and give you some additional growth coming from the ground. Uh, this one, but this is, Again, this is a Southern Living Plant Collection piece and it's been in uh, hot demand and uh, with limited availability for the last few years. Uh, and I have wanted one and finally have one for this garden. I'm just gonna bust those roots up just a bit and we'll just plant it, you know, pretty close to this pretty close to this line. The one thing about these clematis, when they start growing in the spring, they grow so fast. You've got to come out and direct them the direction you want them to go. Otherwise, you know, they're going to very quickly uh, grow on things you don't want them to grow on. They put on growth so fast. This particular clematis is hardy in zone six to nine. There are more cold hardy uh, clematis than that. There's pretty much a clematis for anybody watching from zone probably three to 11. There's so many named uh, so many named cultivars out in the world. Well, again, I've, I've, I've been wanting this one 
uh, back in the garden because uh, at the old house I planted that first season and it had a flower on it pretty much uh, pretty much the entire season. Clematis benefit from having their roots shaded. Think about how vines typically grow in woodland conditions. They have their roots, they germinate down near the base of a tree. They have their roots kind of shaded by that. It takes them several years to really build up the energy to start going up that tree. And then they're going up that tree to get into the sunlight. So they have their roots shaded and their tops in the sun. So this Clematis will have its roots shaded by this butterfly bush, but it'll, be, it'll have the opportunity to climb up something to get itself up into the sun so it can bloom during the summertime. It's kind of the ideal conditions for uh, most clematis and another part of sometimes planting them deep. You know, if they're out in the full sun, those roots will at least be down in a slightly cooler, slightly cooler soil. We have these uh, fetid hellebores out here and I've told you when I planted them, these things can be rather aggressive. They're very different than other hellebores. Uh, other hellebores are, are pretty tame in the garden and whereas some old ones can definitely seed themselves, even that process is super, super slow. It takes years and years and years for hellebores to come to dominate a space. Except for the fetid hellebore, it's really kind of, uh, can be kind of aggressive in the garden. We planted it here with the intent that it could dominate this space and we wouldn't let it get outside of that. And so that's our end goal. And now it's come out over the curb. I normally have my, my truck is parked here a lot of times and it's just been hidden back here. I can go through here and just cut these ones off that are closer to the road to get this cleaned up uh, just like this pretty quick pretty quick and easy and I can prune off this old foliage at the same time from last year because it's putting on new foliage or I'll tell you that there are plants like this that are just tough enough that I can do that <laughs> with the shovel and it won't be it will not be an issue uh, with these with these fetid hellebores uh, they're they're well anchored in the ground and won't have any problem with me just chopping them off that way any seedlings I see I'll just take and I'll flip them over and if I get a sh just a sh very shallow amount of roots like that and then flip it upside down and do that, I'll kill 90% of them in just one, one time through here, just cutting them off like that. That way they're not gonna be spreading about the garden. Just a once a year, once a year thing. And those are pretty much done. I've also got the neighbor's maples always trying to invade this space uh, as well with seedlings. So I'd like to get the get this little area out here by the street edged, which I haven't done this part in years. Put some of this mulch back around this clematis up here. And then I'll just take my shovel and go along this sidewalk or go along this curb and drag it like that. And basically just create a place where that mulch can fall down against the curb without falling into the street. Again, this, this part's never been done before. One other thing about these fetid hellebores or any hellebores or anything that's inv potentially invasive in your garden. It could be ligustrum, it could be anything that's there. Eliagnus, it wouldn't matter what it is. The seed are just setting on these fetid hellebores right now. So if, if I just simply, I can go through here and cut all of these spent flowers off and dispose of them before that seed is fully developed. And that will prevent them from from seeding themselves in this bed anyway. Same thing again with ligustrum. You know, something like ligustrum is about to flower now. And if you'll, as soon as it finishes flowering, if you just shear it off where all the flowers were, you know, that no seed can develop, right? And you can lower your seed bank over some period of time. The other thing is I separated the bigger material from this little project I've had out here. You know, most projects are bigger than this and you're gonna have bigger piles potentially. But this small stuff, this little mulch and debris, I did not mean to throw it right on the tree. <laughs> um, this, uh, this material that's just small like this, I, I take, take my shovel before I, mulch, before I mulch and just spread the stuff back out in the bed. I would always come back when I was, you know, have my landscape company and all of my guys would have filled, we'd have planted 40 plants and they would have filled 40 pots with debris for us to take back to the nursery or to wherever we were gonna dump the material and I'm like, put it back in the bed. It's all organic material. This is all beneficial material. And then we'll put a decorative mulch over the top of it. You'll never know it's there. It's food for the microbes in the soil. We'll break it down and you know we'll feed our plants in the garden here.
That's definitely an improvement, opens this area up quite a bit. This tree will only be about eight to 10 feet in the next five to eight years probably. It's not a very fast growing tree at all. So it's a very small ornamental tree. Uh, and I think, we've got, I think we've got it sited in the right space. It actually opened up a little space under here uh, for uh, potentially planting something, but I'd probably like to leave some access into this bed from this side. This bed is so deep this direction that it's very difficult to mulch this bed. I had a couple piles that were up in here that I hadn't been able to, you know, distribute, you know. This, I, so again, I may leave some where the regular wheelbarrow, not this cart. We have this cart that you'll see in a lot of videos, but we also have, we also have a big dump cart and then we also have a wheelbarrow. So we have three different versions of this. This little low cart, great for a lot of jobs here in the garden. As you see, it's using it off all the time and stuff found it on the side of the road. Uh, but I, I think I can get the regular single wheel uh, wheelbarrow through here to mulch this in the future. So we'll leave some little gap in here where we can access and maintain this a little better. You'll find that out about your garden in time. You'll be like, how am I supposed to mulch that? How am I supposed to take care of it? How am I supposed to prune it? How am I supposed to dispose of things? You know, we need a, we need a, a small entrance into this part of the garden uh, to, to help us out with that. I think overall, this space looks a ton better. This is one of the four corners that we're gonna be hopefully finishing off uh, during this uh, spring growing season. Um, again, we'll, we'll show you when we plant one or two more shrubs in here in all likelihood. But thank you guys so much for following along with it. And uh, the next few weeks, we'll see a couple other corners.